Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies. Today we are going to do the ninth lecture, Mao Zedong Thought. Mao Zedong was the founder of the People's Republic of China. He was the leader of the Communist Party of China that emerged victorious in the civil war with the nationalist who are also known as the Kuomintang, led by Chiang Kai-shek. And he ruled China from 1949 to 1976. Besides being a, a political leader, he was also a, a theorist of Marxism-Leninism. And perhaps he, he, his contribution is immense from a third world perspective of uh, Marxism-Leninism. He was prominent in, in the communist movement from 1921 to 1976. So the Communist Party of China was formed in 1921. He was one of the founding members of the party. And until his death in uh, 1976, he was very active both in politics as well as in the theory of Marxism. His ideas called Mao Zedong thought are part of the constitution of the Communist Party of China as well as the People's Republic of China. If you want to read more about uh, his writings, uh, they are published in his selected works, selected works of Mao Zedong. You can see this, this is available in, in a website called Marxist.org. You can see there are two spellings to his name, do not be confused because of this. Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong is the same thing, it is the same name, it is just that in it is an English transliteration. So, when you write uh, Chinese in, in the Latin script, you have to use uh, different styles. So, the older style, uh, Wade Gills was a, a, a product of uh, Western scholars. And so, when uh, the People's Republic of China was formed, they changed the style, style approved by their government known as the Pinin. So, earlier, uh, this, this, this is the earlier uh, style of writing the name, this is known as Wade Gills. And the Pinin style is this. So it's the same name. There is no difference. Just like say uh, Peking and and Peiching, the Chinese name is Peiching, uh, but uh, when the Westerners went there, they 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 Anglicized it as Peking. P P E K I N G. The Chinese have retained the name of uh, Peking in the university. So there is Peking University. So they have retained that uh, uh, Western name. But in all other places, the Finian style spelling has been uh, used, Beijing, B-E-I-J-I-N-G. Okay, so, so this, this is basically the spelling uh, issue. So, uh, the first five volumes of the selected works uh, were published by the Foreign Languages Press in China, the official uh, publisher in China. The fifth one was withdrawn later on because there are certain controversial things, but it is available in the website. Besides that, there are other four volumes which are published from India. The Maoists in India have published the later four volumes and, and the work is still in progress. His uh, writings are being edited and um, uh, future volumes would also come up. So, if you go through these writings, you get a picture of uh, Mao Zedong thought. But we must also look at the historical background of how uh, Mao Zedong thought emerged in China. Why did it emerge? What were the conditions that uh, led to the necessity of coming up with uh, these ideas? So China had been governed for at least 2000 years by Confucianism. So Confucius, a great venerated scholar in China. His writings and, and the writings of his, of his disciples 
from the orthodox political thinking in China. But uh, the Confucian order began to collapse in, in the uh, towards the end of the 19th century because of the colonial powers. These are some of the colonial powers dividing the Chinese pie among themselves. You can see you have United Kingdom, Germany, Russia, France, Japan and this is old China, Confucian China asking them to stop. But China was not able to stop because Confucian ideas were based on, on things that were of the past, hierarchical society, patriarchal society, uh, importance given to learning and not to commerce and learning also the focus was on cultivating character, cultivating self-control rather than technical education. So all these things basically led to stagnation in China and Chinese were not very out to outward looking. They were not looking to the world to learn from the world. They had a lot of pride in, in their own uh, indigenous knowledge and uh, because of that they were left far behind in, in the international competition. The Chinese in the, in the uh, 19th century were far behind the western powers and so when they the clash came between the west and, and China, China began to crumble. It, it was defeated one by one by the western powers and also by Japan. Japan had quickly learned from the debacles of China and uh, adopted western ideas and be, had become a westernized power. And Japan uh, defeated China decisively in 1994-95 and a treaty, treaty of uh, Shimonoseki was signed in 1895 by which uh, China gave up a number of islands like uh, uh, Taiwan to the Japanese empire, newly emerging Japanese empire. So in, in such a situation, many uh, Chinese leaders emerged who wanted China to modernize. They realized that the old Confucian way of thinking won't work against western powers. If you want to protect yourself, defend yourselves against western powers, you need to learn from them, learn new technology, learn new ideas, learn about new institutions. Only then China can become strong. So China needed a modern westernized nation state and not a civilizational empire if it wanted to compete with the rest of the world. So, uh, one of the leaders of this uh, movement was Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen uh, was an inspiring fi figure. Mao was inspired by Sun Yat-sen and his ideas. So, Sun Yat-sen led the Sinhai revolution. The Sinhai revolution towards the end of 1911, it overthrew the, the imperial rule in China. So, China at that time was ruled by the, the Qing dynasty. The Qing were Manchus uh, ethnically. So, they came from Manchuria and they had conquered uh, China and, and, and many other areas around it and had built a great empire. But uh, this great empire crumbled in the face of western colonialism and, uh, and when the revolution came, they were not able to protect their regime. And um, so mon monarchy was overthrown in China and the Republic of China was established in 1912. So this is the flag, this is the flag of the Qing dynasty and this, is the, this was the new uh, Republican flag. It has five colors. These five colors represent five different ethnicities or nationalities in, in, in China basically. The Han Chinese, that is the Chinese speaking people. Then the uh, the Manchus, uh, then the Mongols, then uh, the Uyghurs and the Tibetans. These were the five main nationalities in, in China. So this flag represents the unity of these uh, different ethnicities within, within the Chinese nation. Now Sun Yat-sen, he gave a kind of an ideological position to the new China, which is based on three principles of the people, San, Min, Chu, Yi. So these three principles are nationalism, democracy and welfare. 
so by nationalism he meant that uh, he, he basically meant kind of a civic nationalism so china is a land of different ethnicities and all ethnicities together form this china and china should be free from foreign interference foreign powers should leave china alone china should become independent and all ethnicities should unite and they should have uh, a proportional share of the government in china it should not be dominated by only the han chinese initially he was a bit of a anti uh, manchu anti manchu because obviously manchus were the ruling class so the among the han chinese there was a sentiment of uh, being anti manchu but gradually uh, he 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 developed this idea of civic nationalism then the second uh, principle is democracy he believed that people should participate in government so these ideas actually come from the definition of democracy given by abraham lincoln democracy is the government of the people by the people and for the people so nationalism is of the people democracy is by the people so uh, a government should be elected by the people and he also believed there should be separation of powers one particular institution should not have all the power so the classical western division is between the legislature executive and judiciary he to that he added two other institutions which were very important in china one was control and the other was examination so he called them yuan or departments in chinese yuan so uh, there uh, should be he, he, he argued that there should be a legislative yuan which makes the laws executive yuan which implements the laws judicial yuan which adjudic adjudicates the laws then a control yuan which will look into corruption and and, and uh, other uh, breach of law by the other other branches and then the examination yuan which will conduct the civil service exa exams and and induct the selected candidates into the bureaucracy so there should be five branches of government according to this thinking what happened was once uh, he was successful in overthrowing the monarchy in in, in china he, he was made the provisional president but he had to resign and power went to the hand of a a chinese general called yuan shikai and yuan shikai was a traditionalist a more of a pragmatist he did not believe in the democratic ideals and therefore uh, sun yat sen thought that if china really had to liberate itself uh, it needed to uh, have three stages so it can could not be a democracy at once initially there needs to be a military dictatorship so a military should conquer china throw out all the foreigners and unite china and then there will be a period of political tutelage so there will be one strong leader and that strong leader would in the intermediate period establish these institutions democratic institutions and only then china should become a democracy that is the idea he developed and then finally welfare so welfare meant that that uh, land should be redistributed among the people and taxation should be based on land ownership uh, so the, he was not fully a communist but you can say uh, to to an extent he was a, a socialist in orientation later on his life he, of course he came close to the communist party and took the help of soviet union in in uh, in establishing his government in the southern part of china so sun yat sen is considered to be the father of modern china both in the people's republic of china as well as in taiwan which is the republic of china now in the 1910s after the republic of china was established a new uh, movement started this was a social and cultural movement rather than a political movement so confucianism was criticized and uh, western ideas were promoted by many scholars okay you can see some of the scholars that i have named chai yuan pei hu shi lu sun chan tu shi li ta chao so these were great scholars and their movement came to be known as new culture movement uh, one of one of the ideas that emerged from this movement was doubting antiquity so the chinese have had a traditional history that traditional understanding of history which begins with the the sage kings of the past like for example the yellow emperor and so on and then it goes to the first three dynasties xia dynasty shang dynasty chou dynasty 
and so on. There is a whole recorded history of China. So, the doubting antiquity uh, school say that we should not accept tradition blindly. There should be critical analysis of tradition. And in fact, uh, due to lack of evidence, they rejected many of the existence of many of the ancient kings of China. Of course, later on it has been found archaeologically proven that Shang dynasty, Xia dynasty actually existed in China. So, so the critical uh, rejection of, of uh, the history was not correct. But at that time you can say it was correct because at that time there was no evidence. Only after the oracle bones were discovered by the archaeologists that the records of the Shang dynasty was found. Uh, anyhow, so, so doubting antiquity. Another thing was the feminist movement. There are some female scholars also uh, in the new culture movement. So, they believe that the foot binding should be stopped, uh, there should be equality in marriage, there should not be patriarchy, women should also get equal political rights, so on and so forth. Now, this was all uh, the popularity of western ideas, but uh, in, the, in the first world war, when Germany was defeated, Germany also had a portion of China under its control. So, the Japanese, they quickly in the, in the war attacked the, the German position and took, took it over. And they said it, they should, they have the right to uh, take over the German positions because of their participating in the war. And the Chinese said that we also were on the side of the allies in the war. Uh, but uh, the, the, the demands of the Japanese were accepted by the Western powers and also by the Chinese government. There were these uh, demands that they made on, on the Chinese government and Chinese government was not capable of defending itself against the Japanese and so they had to uh, give in to the demands made by the Japanese of territorial concessions in China. So as a result, many uh, uh, people started criticizing the western powers for being silent, silently accepting the aggression of Japan towards China and uh, this culminated in what is known as the May 4th movement. So, in the May, May, May 4th movement, this was in 1919, students gathered on the streets of, of uh, Beijing and they started protesting and uh, they said that we should bring down all the old traditions and institutions of China and should adopt Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. So, that is the way forward. Complete westernization is the way forward and in this path of westernization, gradually there was a split within the uh, Chinese progressive movement uh, into two parts. One was pro-West, another was pro-Soviet because by 1917, there was the Bolshevik revolution and uh, Soviet Russia had been established and after a few years, uh, Soviet Union was established, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And so that became a new beacon of hope to the colonized people. They thought that Marxism, Leninism is the path forward. And uh, the Soviet Union also established an organization called Communist International or Com Intern. So, Com Intern had many agents who were who sent uh, in different parts of the world and they established communist parties. So, in China in 1921, the Communist Party of China was established. Now, as I told you, Sun Yat Sen uh, gradually developed a kind of a soft corner towards uh, Marxism and towards Soviet Union because they were helping him in his uh, mission to, you know, liberate China from the foreign powers and to establish a modern uh, nation state in China. And so, mediated by the Communist International, Kuomintang, which was the political party of uh, Sun Yat Sen and the Communist Party of China came together and this came to be known as the United Front. The members of the Communist Party became the members of Kuomintang. So, they took the membership of the Kuomintang and accepted the leadership of Sun Yat-sen and they established a government in southern part of China and their goal was to liberate the rest of China, reunite China into one state. But uh, Sun Yat-sen died soon after this uh, United Front was established and he was succeeded by Chiang Kai-shek as, as the leader, Chiang Kai-shek. Now Chiang Kai-shek had anti-communist feelings. 
Okay, he was not very convinced by communism, and uh, with the help of the communist, he he started the northern expedition. He he invaded the northern parts of China, which are under warlords. Different uh, generals, former generals of the Qing army, they control different parts of China at that time. Uh, the interior parts of China, where the southern part, the coastal area, was under the Kuomintang. So Chiang Kai Shek launched a military campaign known as Northern Expedition to defeat these warlords and then force them to accept the sovereignty of the of the Kuomintang government of the Republic of China government and he, he was succeeding in this he was able to defeat these warlords and some of the warlords accepted although they did not give up their power but they accepted the leadership of Chiang Kai Shek. And he, he took this opportunity to purge the Kuomintang of the communists because he believed that the communists were infiltrating the Kuomintang in order to weaken it from inside and then through a revolution overthrow the Kuomintang government. And so he decides to purge the communists. The communists were persecuted, large number of them were killed. And this is the beginning of the first civil war. Uh, and the communists were not successful, they were not able to stop Chiang Kai Shek. And so they embarked on path of uh, going uh, in, into the interior mountainous regions of China in order to protect themselves. So this is known as the Long March 1934 to 35. So they kept on marching, saving themselves from the Kuomintang forces and ultimately they reached a place known as Yanan. Yan'an based period. So, this is from 1937 to 1945. During this period, Mao Tse Tung was able to emerge as the undisputed leader of the Chinese communist. He had many rivals whom he over, overcame one by one. Okay. And he was able to overcome this because his focus was on a peasant revolution. Many, many of his uh, rivals uh, actually, they had more of a bookish knowledge. They, they believed in the orthodox Marxist uh, workers revolution. But Mao Tse Tung argued that China was a, an agricultural country. More than 90% of the population were peasants. So unless peasants participate in the revolution, no revolution can be successful. But if the peasants join the communists, uh, then surely the revolution will be successful. And to win the confidence of the peasants, Mao engaged in land reforms. He, he took away land from the landlords and the rich peasants and distributed them among the poorer peasants and landless laborers, thus creating a very strong support base for the communist. And in this time, uh, Japanese had invaded China. So, the Japanese aggression of China began in 1931 when they captured Manchuria. But in 1937, they launched a full-fledged invasion of China to take over the rest of China. And Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang government was opposing the Japanese. And they were forced to form an alliance with the communists because this argued that in, in, in face of the Japanese aggression, all the Chinese, whether communist or not communist, should all come together and fight against this common threat. And so there was the second united front from 1937 to 45 when they fought against the Japanese. But once the Japanese were defeated uh, with the help of the allies, basically United States and at the last moment Soviet Union also entered into the war in the east after defeating Germans in the west, Soviet Union uh, invaded Manchuria and so uh, and, and the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan and so Japan surrendered. But uh, as soon as Japan uh, was defeated, Again, there was the split between Kuomintang and the communist. So basically, Chiang Kai-shek versus Mao Tse Tung. And that led to the second civil war. But because Soviet Union had captured Manchuria and the northern parts of China, and large number of equipments of, of the Japanese, they were able to help the communists. They simply handed over the territories to the communists. And the communists, because Beijing is in the north, so the communists were able to capture the capital and decisively defeat the Kuomintang. Americans did not, actually Amer Americans were trying to be neutral. They were trying to mediate between the two, two sides, which are not successful. 
on the other hand soviet union was actively helping the communist come to power because the cold war had began and the uh, the soviets needed allies so they felt that if in a large country like china communist come to power then they would have a very strong ally against the west <clears throat> so by 1949 the communist had emerged victorious and the people's republic of china was inaugurated on 1st of october 1949 by mao zedong and he said we have stood up after a century of humiliation 100 years of oppression by foreign powers china has finally become independent and stood up and is united under the rule of the communist party now let us look at some of the policies of mao after he came to power so as soon as the communists came to power they first introduced land reforms so land reforms began in 1949 in fact land reforms were going on even before that even uh, in the yanan period and then during the civil war period the communists wherever they established their rule they took away land from the landlords and distributed among the peasants and that made them very popular and the peasants joined the communist movement many of them joined the people's liberation army people's liberation army is the military wing of the uh, communist party of china so and and controlled by the communists so still the people's liberation army is actually controlled not by the chinese state by but by the communist party so land reforms intensified hundreds of thousands of landlords were killed at the orders of the communists they said that in every village a few landlords should be killed so that would give confidence to the people because there is a sense of fear among the people towards the landlord because landlord has been uh, had been oppressing the peasants for uh, many generations and so to remove that fear of the landlord or and also a sense of respect because the common uh, people in the villages they considered landlords as kind of a father like figure but uh, to remove all that to remove both the fear as well as the respect that the people had towards the landlords the communist party ordered the peasants to criticize the landlords and also execute some of them as punishment if if they had say committed some acts of violence against the peasants and thus hundreds of thousands of landlords were killed in this particular movement they also uh, the communists also uh, started the purge movement so the government was filled with bureaucrats loyal to the kuomintang although a large section of the kuomintang they escaped to the island of taiwan still the government structure the bureaucracy remained and so many of these bureaucrats were loyal to kuomintang and even though they might not be loyal to kuomintang they were not communists so ideologically they were not pure in that sense and so through the three nts and the and the five nts movement in the name of fighting corruption and bureaucratization waste bribery and so on tax evasion many uh, bureaucrats as well as industrialists they were all purged they were arrested they were uh, uh, interrogated and public trials were held some of them were executed so in that way both in the rural areas as well as urban areas there was a purge of all the potential anti communist all those people who could oppose the communist rule and uh, threaten uh, their uh, uh, its continuation uh, so uh, the anti counter revolution this is all part of the same movement by this time the chinese constitution had had been written down 1954 the first constitution and uh, a stable form of government had been established in the people's republic of china and so uh, in 1956 mao announced that he wants people to freely express their views because chinese uh, philosophy is based on letting 100 flowers bloom so there is a chinese saying let 100 flowers bloom let 100 schools of thought contend so mao launched the 100 flowers movement people are asked you are free to criticize if there is any flaw with us we we'll listen to the criticism will make corrections because we are confident about the superiority of the communist system so let people criticize and this was also a time of destalinization in 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 the soviet union khrushchev had come to power after the death of stalin and he had made his secret speech in which he had exposed the crimes committed by stalin on the soviet people and uh, chinese communists were aware of of 
the speech and the whole de-Stalinization process. Perhaps this uh, 100 flowers movement was also inspired by that. So Mao thought that if people may criticize him after his death, so it is better for them to come forward and criticize him. So many intellectuals came forward and they offered suggestions to the government how to improve the governance in China. Some even went on to criticize the Communist Party. And after one year, Mao launched the anti-rightist campaign and all those intellectuals critiques were removed from their post, they were persecuted, they were sent to the countryside, some of them were executed. Okay, so Mao prou proudly proclaimed that I am greater than Sri Wangti. Sri Wangti was the first Chinese emperor and Sri Wangti was viciously anti-Confucian and he had buried 460 Confucian scholars alive. Um, this is basically a, a, a belief in China. Uh, so Mao said, I am greater than Sri Wangti. He, he buried only 460 scholars. I have buried 460,000 scholars. Okay, so there is a mass scale persecution of scholars. Universities were purged of, of, of the scholars. They were all sent to the countryside, some were beaten up, tortured and even executed. So, people say that 100 flowers movement was only basically a trap laid by Mao in order to lure the critiques, uh, lure them out and so that they could be identified and then removed. And this was for Mao the right time to launch his ambitious great leap forward, which was uh, an attempt to transform in, uh, China into a great economy, more uh, robust and powerful than the British economy and, and competing with the American economy. And for that he believed the will of the people was important. China was not very rich in natural resources like Soviet Union, it was not industrialized. But he believed that the Chinese people had the capacity to build a developed economy. And so he put the responsibility on the people, asked them to come forward and increase agricultural production, increase steel production, so that China can also become industrialized. China can also feed all its people and export the grains in order to get, gain capital and that capital would then be used to build industries and thus within 15 years China would become a developed industrialized country. But this great leap forward was a complete failure. The record says say maybe between 30 million to 45 million people died in the great leap forward because famines were there in China, somewhere there were floods, there were droughts. Uh, but uh, people who had the Communist Party cadre were all sending positive reports to the center because they had been given quotas and they say we have already fulfilled the quotas, in, fa in fact exceeded the quotas and they were sending very positive reports and the central government was not aware of what was happening and uh, people perished in disease, in floods, in drought, famines and they were producing steels in the backyard by uh, melting their uh, furniture and all. it was completely crap, it was useless steel, not of the industrial uh, quality. And by 1959, Communist Party admitted that the Great Leap Forward was a failure and Mao had to resign as the chairman of the People's Republic of China and hand over power to the next generation of leaders. So uh, Liu Shaoqi, he emerged as the new leader. And he was supported by Tang Xiaoping. So they believe in a more incentive based economy that let people produce uh, goods, give them incentive if they produce more, let them sell their product in the market, let them earn some profit and that will give them incentives to incentive to increase production. And in, in industry also, pay workers according to their work, okay. if, if they are working more and if they are producing more, they should be paid more, there should not be equality of salaries. And this thing worked, this led to increase in productivity both in the industry as well as agriculture. And Mao was very jealous of this, Mao did not like it, he believed that this was a deviation from the socialist principle and he called them Liu Shaoqi and Tang Xiaoping as capitalist roaders. So he believed that even though Communist Party rule had been established, even though the leaders of China were communist, 
from outside, but in, actually from inside they were capitalists. And so he started what is known as the socialist education campaign. So he traveled uh, or different parts of China and he built a base. He tried to through education try to you know increase his influence among the public so that he could launch his biggest movement the great proletarian cultural revolution. He said bombard the headquarters. So the headquarters of the communist party was attacked by the red guards. These were fanatical followers of Mao, young uh, boys and girls, students. They basically attacked the various uh, communist party offices. The president of China was beaten up, he was uh, tortured and he died within couple of years because he was denied medication. His wife, the first lady was paraded in public as a pro dressed up as a prostitute. Uh, uh, the, the son of Tang Xiaoping, he was thrown from the, uh, uh, I think it was the third floor of the building of the university and he was paralyzed for life. Uh, Chou Enlai's uh, adopted daughter was uh, uh, raped, murdered and her body burned by Chiang Ching, the wife of Mao. And so this was a period when no one was safe or you may be the president of China, you could be the prime minister, you could be the son of the prime minister, daughter of prime minister, you are not safe. So everyone became the victim of the red guards. Children spoke against their parents. They, they said that, or, or, or they said that the, my father or mother had criticized Mao, spoken against Mao and so they were then persecuted publicly. Students turned against teachers. They said the teacher in the lecture had one day said a negative thing about Mao and so the teacher would be beaten up and, and interrogated and humiliated in public. So communist party officials, teachers, parents all came under the wrath of the Red Guards instigated by Mao himself. This was his way of removing all his rivals and concentrating power in his own hands. And in this he was supported by Lin Piao. Lin Piao was uh, declared his successor. Lin Piao was the defense minister of China. So once the red cards removed all the important people from power, uh, Mao did not want anarchy to continue and so he ordered Lin Piao to send the military. So the People's Liberation Army was called and the Red Guards were ordered to go to the countryside to learn from the peasants. So all these young boys and girls, they uh, instead of studying in schools, colleges and universities, went to the countryside preaching the, the writings of Mao from the little red book and doing farming and all kinds of manual labor. Now Lin Piao became very powerful and Mao was growing suspicious of, of Lin Piao. So in 1971, before Mao could purge him, Lin Piao decided to organize a coup against Mao and capture power himself. But Mao was protected by Chou Enlai and uh, some loyal generals. As a result, Lin Piao was unable to be successful and so he tried to escape with his family in an aircraft, but that aircraft crashed in Mongolia and Lin Piao and his family died. Now Chou Enlai had become very powerful uh, um, after the death of Lin Piao because all other leaders had been removed. Only Chou Enlai, who was the premier of China from the very beginning, was basically taking care of the Chinese economy as well as the foreign policy. This was the time when China was opening up to the United States. There was a rapprochement with the United States with the support of Mao. But Mao had a, a group of fanatical followers known as Gang of Four, which included his wife, Chiang Chin. So they basically tried to poison the ears of Mao against Chou Enlai, because Chou Enlai was very popular, he was a moderate in that sense. So people liked him, he did not really have jealousy towards people, he did not try to harm other people. In fact, he tried to protect many of the leaders of communist party from persecution and therefore he, he was popular and Mao started getting jealous of, of this. In fact, uh, Chou Enlai because he needed support, he was getting old and sick and so he advised Mao to bring back Tang Xiaoping into the government because Tang Xiaoping was an effective administrator and so he was brought back. 
and then Mao used Tang Xiaoping to criticize Zhou Enlai. So, uh, anti-Confucius movement was launched. Now, there was no Confucius alive. Confucianism was a thing of a old. Although there could be some old people who still believed in Confucianism, but Chinese society had basically been purged of uh, Confucianism. So, what is anti-Confucius movement? It was basically targeting Zhou Enlai because the personality of Zhou Enlai reflected a, a Confucian scholar, a, a quiet, straight person who was dedicated to virtue, who did not have any vices, who thought about the people. So, that is a typical Confucian uh, scholar. So, so, this is not a character of a communist leader according to Mao. A communist leader should not be like a Confucian virtuous scholar. He should be a man of the people living like peasants. And so, uh, Cho Enlai was sidelined and Cho Enlai by that time uh, he had been uh, uh, diagnosed with cancer, throat cancer and he was about to die. Uh, and in fact, he died in 1976, beginning of 1976, January. And Tang Xiaoping was again removed from power. He was again purged from uh, government at that time. And Gang of Four emerged as the uh, most powerful entity. But Mao did not appoint anyone from the Gang of Four as his successor. Instead, he appointed Hua Kuofang as the successor, who was not a, such an important leader. And then Mao. So basically, he was made first the premier after Chou Enlai died. Hua Kuofang was made the premier, and then uh, just before dying, he appointed him as the vice chairman of the Communist Party, basically successor to Mao. So when Mao died, Hua Kuofang became the leader of the Communist Party, and he followed the policy known as two whatever. He was loyal to Mao, and he intended to continue the policies of Mao. So this is a brief kind of a uh, historical development of Mao Tse Tung thought. So, what do we get? What are some of the principles that we can understand? So, that is the history. Now, let us look at some of the principles. And I have also mentioned the, the particular essay from which this idea has been taken. So, you can go to marxist.org and, and read uh, these essays for yourself. Seeking truth from facts. So, Mao believed that you should not be dogmatic. You should not only read books on Marxism and follow that blindly. You should see what the social conditions are and learn the truth from the actual facts on the ground. But this is not empiricism, it should be a mixture of theory and practice. Then he believed that the peasants are a revolutionary class um, uh, because uh, they are impoverished, they are exploited and so they also want to change the system. And therefore, he believed that the peasants and workers should form an alliance only then a socialist revolution will be possible in the colonized countries. In the, in the developed countries, maybe the workers can lead the revolution, but not in uh, poorer countries, the colonies like India and China, which had large peasant population. Then he also believed in the genius of the peasants. He believed in learning from the peasants. This is called mass line. So, just because you are an elite, you are well educated, don't think you know everything. So, you, are, you have read all the books written by Karl Marx. So, you can preach to everyone. He believed that a real communist should go and learn from the peasants. Uh, then he also started something known as self-criticism and party rectification. He believed that although someone may be a communist, the mindset may still be capitalist or feudal. And therefore, from time to time, there should be rectification of the party. People should engage in self-criticism. Not Mao, of course. He used all these tools to remove his rivals and, and accumulate more and more power. Then uh, another important concept is new democratic revolution. So, he believed that uh, a proletarian revolution was not pos possible in a, in a poor country, a non-industrialized country and therefore, there should be an alliance between peasants and workers and also alliance with other classes like the petty bourgeois or uh, even the national bourgeois who were revolutionary in orientation, who wanted to overthrow the feudal class, who wanted to throw out the uh, the colonial masters. So, all these revolutionary uh, classes could come together and that the revolution would be a new democratic revolution. It won't be a bourgeois revolution like the French revolution uh, and it won't be a workers revolution like the Russian uh, Bolshevik revolution. It would be something in the middle which will be led by the communist and the workers 
but with the support of other classes. So, this was called a new democratic revolution. And once he was able to succeed in his revolution, the form of government that he established came to be known as people's democratic dictatorship. Karl Marx had said there should be dictatorship of the proletariat. But again Mao said because China follows new democracy, dictatorship of the proletariat is not possible. Instead, there should be people's democratic dictatorship, which basically means the rule of the communist party. But uh, there will be more toleration uh, towards other classes besides the workers. And in line with uh, Sun Yat Sen's three principles of the people, he gave three new people's principles. Okay, that is alliance with the Soviet Union and the communists. So, the, the true nationalists in China should align with the Soviet Union and the communists and support the peasants and workers. Only then you should be accepted as a true follower of Sun Yat Sen. This was basically a criticism of Chiang Kai shek because Chiang Kai shek was pro West and he hated the communists and his power base was basically the Chinese middle class and the industrialists. Then Mao is also considered to be a military genius. He, he, he advocated guerrilla warfare, uh, basically uh, attack the enemy, take over some portion of the land, do land reforms, gain, gain the support of the people and become very powerful, form a very strong base in the interior. Don't go out in the open and fight. In, in, in interior regions, which is unreachable for the government or the enemy, form your strong base, build support among the people and then from there attack the cities, surround the cities and then capture the cities. This is known as the people's war. Then his focus was also on contradictions, that there are different types of contradictions in society. There are antagonistic contradictions, for example, between the Kuomintang and the communist or say between the colonial powers and the feudal uh, power versus the uh, common masses. These are antagonistic contradictions. There, these contradictions have to be fought through war. But there were other contradictions which were non-antagonistic, say between the peasants and the workers. So these type of contradictions should be resolved through dialogue and, and uh, through coming together. He also believed in the concept of continuous revolution. So once the base is changed, once the Communist Party has come to power, the economic system has been changed. The superstructure, the ideology, the ideas of people do not change and therefore revolution is not secure. Therefore revolution should continue, there should be no stoppage of the revolution. Until a classless and stateless society has been achieved, revolution should continue. Every decade, every few years, there should be mass movements in order to purge the capitalist tendency. So, the great proletarian culture revolution was a product of this type of a thinking. And in international relations, he gave the three worlds theory. In 1960, there was a split between the Soviet Union and China, known as the basically called the Sino-Soviet split. And he began criticizing both the United States as well as the Soviets. Soviets he called social imperialist and the Americans imperialist. And he believed that they are the first world, trying to dominate the world. And then there was the second world. Second world were those countries which either sided with the Soviet Union or United States. He believed that these were like tributaries to the two superpowers. And then there was the third world who were independent of the influence of the two superpowers. And China belonged to the third world and China was actually the leader of the third world. So this is the three worlds theory. So these are some of the ideas that we can uh, learn from Mao Zedong thought. Impact of Mao Zedong thought. First obvious impact is establishment of People's Republic of China. It was the ideas of Mao and his leadership that led to the foundation of the People's Republic of China and, and People's Republic of China continues. Unlike say Soviet Union that which collapsed, People's Republic of China continues. It may be in, in a different form than envisaged by Mao, but the entity remains and this is a contribution of Mao. Then uh, secondly, land redistribution. So, China was a feudal society, a small group of people owned most of the land in China and there was a lot of oppression of the people and uh, Mao ensured that the land was redistributed. Of course, he reversed that whole thing by collectivizing the land and establishing people's communes. So, uh, perhaps if he had continued with the uh, redistribution policy and stopped at that because in the 1980s when China again started reforms. Household responsibility system was 
reintroduced and so all the people's communes established by Mao were de-established. But still uh, it is an idea that, that came from Mao Zedong thought. Then he established what is known as the iron rice ball system. So uh, basically it means that people would be provided with all their necessities from cradle to grave. From their birth to death, state will provide all the basic necessities. And for that, household registration system, hukou system was introduced. Everyone had to be registered at a particular address. And based on that registration, they were given food rations, they, they could use their coupons to buy uh, products, they could access hospitals and schools. So it is, it is all based on hukou. If you don't have registration, says your children won't get admission in school, you won't get admitted in hospital. So hukou system. The other is the tanwei system, tanwei system or work unit. So in, in the cities and even in the, in the people's communes in, in the rural areas, everyone belonged to a certain work unit and it was the duty of the work unit to provide employment to the members. So you are guaranteed employment, no one could be unemployed because all were members of work units, either you are a member of Tanwe or you are a member of the people's commune. So everyone had employment because of this. So this is known as the iron rice ball system. Of course, in, in, in a sense it provided stability to the Chinese people, but it also kept them poor. There was no incentive to come out of this, to be successful in life, to develop new technologies, to educate yourselves. So that was not required. Then of course, uh, China. China became an independent great power because of Mao. Mao uh, took China to different wars and emerged victorious. For example, the Korean War. Korean War was a big success for uh, Mao. In fact, before that the Civil War. So Mao won the Civil War. You can say he won a Korean War in, in, in the sense because, because he was facing more powerful forces and he was able to stop them and, and, and protect the independence of North Korea. And so the, in that sense, he was successful in Korean War. Then uh, he defeated India in, in the 1962 war, humiliated Nehru. He also helped uh, Vietnam in its war against America. So in that sense, I think there is no war that Mao lost. Every war Mao participated in, in was successful. And although China was poor, still he established China as an independent power. So that is an achievement. In the, on the negative side, Mao's policies led to massive death and persecution of Chinese people. According to some figures, about 70 million people died unnaturally because of Mao's policy, either to famines, to executions and diseases and all kinds of things. And 70 million in Indian uh, number system would be 7 crore. So 7 crore people died. If, if say some, someone kills uh, a thousand people in some riot and it is a big issue. But here, how many people died? 7 crores, it is a huge number, you, know, it, it, you cannot imagine it, it is several times more than Stalin and Hitler. Uh, so, so that is a negative. Then the last decade from 1966 to 1976, because of the cultural revolution, Chinese youth lost their opportunity to study, to develop their careers and China lost a whole decade in terms of knowledge technological knowledge in terms of what uh, it could progress. The whole 10 year uh, period was lost to the Chinese people and China by, by the end of uh, Mao's period that is 1976 was a very, very poor country. Mao's idea inspired revolutions abroad, say in, in Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh, he was inspired by Mao or the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia was inspired, Fidel Castro took some inspiration. Of course was more closer to the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, there was some influence because Cuba was also a poor country, a peasant society. And then Nepal, uh, recently the Maoists in Nepal, they were of course they used the name Maoist and so they have come to power, not by the, on their own, but in alliance with other, other parties have come to power and so uh, Prachanda, the leader of the Nepali Maoist was inspired by Mao. Then of course in India also, Naxalite insurgency, Charu Majumdar, Kanu Sanyal from Naxalbari, they were influenced by Maoist idea. So that has led to the emergence of the Red Corridor in, in, in uh, some districts of India, where uh, the Naxals or the Maoist 
are still active and it has caused a lot of violence and death in in india so we we'll stop here and we'll continue with our lectures thank you Confucian cosmology is a very interesting way of understanding the Chinese mind. A lot of emphasis has been made on how the Chinese mind works. People are very curious about knowing uh, this. Uh, so this may be, perhaps this will help you to get some idea about the Chinese mind. So in the Confucian uh, cosmology, the most important aspect is heaven. Heaven is at the top. Now heaven here does not refer to some kind of a uh, Abrahamic heaven where, or, or even a Buddhist heaven. It, it, heaven here simply means some kind of a cosmic law, some kind of power that controls everything happening in, on earth. So that is heaven. So heaven is what decides what the course of events on earth. And there is an intermediary between the heaven and earth that is the state. So son of heaven or emperor and today's times you can call it state. So state is an intermediary, the state has to represent heaven on earth and therefore people have to be obedient to uh, the state. So just like people are obedient to heaven because if they, don't, uh, if they are not obedient to heaven, the heaven is going to punish them through natural calamities, through problems and enemies and so on. Similarly, the state because it represents heaven, people have to be obedient to the state and if in case they go against the state, they will be punished. Of course, if the state goes against heaven, if the state is uh, uh, promoting things which are uh, against the truth, so then people can revolt. It would be very unstable in such, such, a, such a condition. It would punish the state through natural calamities, foreign aggression, internal disturbance. And, and so you can identify when the state is mandate of heaven. In this particular type of a thinking, there is a whole four occupations top. So gentry today say would refer to the cadre of the Communist Party who are of China. Then the peasants, so food production China. Perhaps this hierarchy has changed a bit in, in the peasants. These are uh, people working in say industry today. And then be I think higher in the current system. So be below gentry maybe merchants and then the peasants. So the hierarchy has changed a bit in, in more the hierarchy. And then there is the hierarchy of the state relations. So China is at the center. So China first. And then there are tributaries which are friendly towards China, except the primacy of China. So they are called tributary states. Say for example, the Pakistan, yeah. Pakistan of Korea, sometimes it's sometimes with China. So North Korea has been consistent of Soviet Union has been more pro. Some other countries like Cambodia, and even Central Asia, which are friendly towards China, is now trying to pull also into this orbit of the states. And then there are countries which uh, do not accept the. China. They try to behave with China equals or even superior. The countries are considered to be bad. So generally, it says Japan, United States, India. These are barbarian type of a point of view. application of cosmology to current Chinese understanding. Thank you. <laughs>